Thank you so much for joining us again. We're in a brand new series on marriage focused in the Old Testament book, Song of Songs. If you are not familiar with this amazing piece of literature and poetry from the Old Testament, uh, it provides a vivid description of the romantic love that spouses share. Our goal is to encourage and rediscover biblical intimacy. I believe that marriages today are struggling, that a lot of us are out on an island on our very own, that life has been created so that we are constantly running in different directions and spouses are no longer able to run together in the same direction. But if you're joining us today with a young one, know that the language that we are going to use in these next few weeks is appropriate. And it may also be an amazing starting point for conversation with your children. Uh, I want to add another note before we get into this. I know that this subject, the subject of marriage, feels like a weight on a lot of people's shoulders. Maybe you've lost someone that you've adored, that you've been married to. Maybe you've experienced the pain of divorce. Or maybe you are still at that point where you're looking for this love of your life, this person that you're going to share absolutely everything with. I want you to hear that your past and your current circumstances do not make you any less valuable in the kingdom of God. So if you're engaging with this lesson and it feels like, man, this is just a weight on my shoulders. I don't want to hear this for a few weeks. Uh, know that God absolutely adores you. No matter what your past or your current circumstances are, I know that God has big plans for you for your future. So engage with us in this series. So let's begin. Uh, I want to begin with something that, that may sound off when you first hear it, but your spouse is the most important relationship that you will ever have. And I want to clarify, the most important relationship that you will ever have outside of God is your spouse. They are capable of bringing you to the highest of eyes and also to the lowest of lows. It's a relationship where you are so vulnerable and so open uh, that it has this opportunity to just bring you up or tear you down. But no one will ever know you as intimately as your spouse knows you. You're going to walk through the most important events of life together. You're going to walk down that aisle and hold hands. You're going to take off that veil and see that person that you will spend the rest of your life with. You will have children together. You will hold their hand when they are sick and hurting. Through some of the most painful and beautiful moments of your life, you are going to share that with this other person. Your spouse knows when you are strong. Your spouse knows when you are weak. And this all comes out as an essential ingredient in marriage. This ingredient we're calling intimacy. Intimacy is what makes marriage. It's not a ceremony. It's not a piece of paper that you're given after the ceremony. What makes a marriage strong and what makes a marriage thrive, what makes a marriage pick you up when you're at your lowest is this intimate relationship that you get to share with another person. This physical, mental, and spiritual intimacy is essential. For the next few weeks, we're going to be examining a book that is called The Song of Songs. This book is, is absolutely intriguing because it almost historically did not make the cut. When the ancients were compiling these books that we are going to call scripture, this book was just so risque and it, it, it doesn't give any explicit mention of God. It's one of two books in scripture that doesn't. It's very graphic at times, but it's also very important. We find this non-linear set of poems that it were designed by God to be loved and to love others. So we see in this book that we are designed from creation to love others and to be loved. And we get this from a jealous God who also wants that relationship with his children. He wants to know absolutely everything about us. You see, God requires intimacy in relationship. And the book Song of Songs shows us that this same intimacy from this jealous God who loves and adores us is able to be shared with someone else. 
Uh, it's also important to know that this is a set of poems that is non-linear, that were compiled together. Nowadays, it would a lot, be a lot like a folk song. We're going to show you an example of how this structure runs. He's my baby, and I'm his honey. Never gonna let him go. In spite of ourselves, we'll end up sitting on a rainbow. Against all odds, honey, we're the big door prize. We're gonna spike our noses right off of our faces. There won't be nothing but big old hearts just dancing in our eyes. Let's read the first act of this poem together. Song of Songs, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exult and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. I am very dark but lovely. O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where your pasture, your flock, where you make it, lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself besides the flock of your companions? If you do not know, O oh, most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. While the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engidi. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved. Truly delightful. Our couch is green. The beams of our houses are cedar. Our rafters are pine. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. This poem, which if you have not engaged with poems that are thousands of years old, may seem like references are a little bit lost on you. But there's so much beauty and I want to invite you to kind of engage and dig deeper into what they're describing in this biblical poetry. But it opens with this desire for the bride to connect with her groom. She adores this man, and we get a clue on why she adores him so much in verse 3. She says, whose name is oil poured out. You see, she desires him physically because she knows his character. Whoever this groom is that's going to be developed as this poem continues, we find early on that he has a good name, that he is a man of good character, that when she sees this man, she sees somebody that she respects. And this respect begins this path of intimacy. It gives us this idea that she is enraptured with who he is as a man. So men, intimacy begins with your name. And if you want to connect with your spouse, be the man that God has called you to be. Let her see your kindness. Let her see your compassion. Let her see how dependable of a man that you are. Men, you have to be her rock before you can become her lover. And men, a strong name will lead to a strong relationship. Let's pick back up in verse 5 of chapter 1. I am very dark but very lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, 
where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself besides the flocks of your companions? To hear a person that you love and adore describe their insecurities can hurt so much when you see so much beauty behind the words that they are saying. And we find in this passage that she starts describing herself as not looking like the other girls. She says, my skin is dark. I think it's very important that we understand that this is not a passage of scripture that is about ethnicity. In the ancient world, the rich stayed inside because they had servants that did all of their works. But the lower class was outside in the sun. So we get this picture that this bride is saying to her groom, I I am not of the same social class as these other girls. I don't have the beauty that maybe they have or that culture expects me to have. I have worked so hard and I'm afraid that you are not going to love what you see. You see, the issue that she is dealing with is social rather than racial. She doesn't feel like she measures up. If this was a modern storytelling, if this was a modern poem, she would say, I'm not photoshopped like the other girls. There's not enough filters that you can run over me to make me look like I feel that I should look. She's saying, I don't measure up to what society's view of beauty is. But let's lean in and listen to his response picking up in verse 8. If you do not know, O most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats besides the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. Verse eight is so incredibly beautiful. After she goes through this list of insecurities that she has, she says, man, I I just don't feel like I measure up with other girls. I've worked hard my whole life. I haven't had the same opportunities. I'm lower class. It's almost like he looks past that. And he says this, if you don't know how to find me, Follow the tracks of the flock. And what he's telling his bride is this. I don't hear all of this noise that you're saying about not being beautiful, but I want you to come to me right now. And the next verse doesn't read as poetically to modern ears uh, as it did back in the day. Back in the day, this next verse that we're going to talk about, all the girls would have fainted. They would have said, oh, that's the most beautiful thing. But he essentially says, you look like the best horse in the entire kingdom. Now, gentlemen, I want to encourage you as a challenge this week. Don't actually say that to your wife at all. Because definitely intimacy will escape you in all forms. But in the ancient world, this was such a kind comment and this was such a beautiful thing. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's look a little deeper into that analogy. You see, Pharaoh's main mare was his pride and his joy. It would have been the most beautiful and graceful horse in the entire kingdom. And it would have been the one that was specifically decided and selected to draw the king's chariot. You see, only one horse was good enough. And it wasn't like the other horses. This is the strongest, most capable horse. So the meaning of this comparison or this analogy is absolutely beautiful. He's saying other women may be fair. They may come from a better social class but you are the one that I prize. You see, insecurity invites opportunity for intimacy. When your spouse looks at the world and doesn't feel like they measure up, when they look around and say, you know what? I'm not like these Photoshopped people. I don't have the skills that these other people have. Remind them why they are the most important person in your world. Remind them why you want to be with them. But men, I want to remind you, words alone do not make your bride feel loved. I've had an absolute blessing in my life to see so many strong men and women go through the journey of marriage together. And there are so many lessons that I was able to pull away from their wonderful and strong marriages. And here's a few things that really stuck out to me about some people in my life. One, they made time for their spouse consistently. You see, marriage is a lot like a garden. 
It takes our full focus every single day. Every new day invites a new opportunity to engage and grow that relationship that you have with your spouse. Secondly, just like the lover in our passage, love her for who she is. Appreciate and acknowledge the unique person that you are married to. You see, there is not another person like your bride on the planet. She was made in the image of God. She was made special. Cherish what is special about your bride. And the third thing I've seen from beautiful marriages that have gone before me is marriage requires vulnerability. Just as much as you appreciate uh, them for their uniqueness, understand that they want to know you as well. Be vulnerable with the one that you say that you love. So church, as we come to a close this morning, you were designed by God to love and to be loved. But this love requires vulnerability. And the same is true with our faith with God. When we come before God, he doesn't want us just to say that we love him. He wants to know us completely. He wants to know what's going on inside our lives, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because he deeply desires to be a part of our life. Couples, we want to invite you this week to read at some point during the week Song of Songs chapter 1 beginning in verse 1 through chapter 2 verse 1 together. You'll have opportunities in this passage to read the section that is for the bride and to read the section uh, for the groom. Read these scriptures together. Practice vulnerability. Practice intimacy this week. And may your marriage be strong because a strong marriage points us to a strong God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for showcasing what true love looks like. Father, thank you that you pursued us when we fell short. God, you have been faithful when we have been faithless. As we look at your son's sacrifice on the cross, let us see the self-sacrificing love that you call us to. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Church, we are in a very difficult time. 2020 has brought unique challenges and problems. You are not called to walk through your challenges and problems alone. If your marriage is on the rocks, and maybe it's not even marriage, but you're just struggling with something, we would love to come beside you and get you the help that you need. Please follow that link below to, lo to let us know how we can come beside you. We also want to give you an opportunity to let us know what's going on in your life that we can be praying about. Follow that same link and let us know so that we can put you on our prayer list and have a group of people praying over what you are going through right now. Church, we also want to give you an opportunity to give as an act of worship. You can follow that link below and you can support the ministry that is happening here at Hickory Valley Christian Church. We believe that God is moving and doing big things in our community and we thank you for coming beside us in that way. Church, go be the hands and feet of Jesus this week.